Today we're going to have Marco Valli, Professor of Space Physics uh, in the Department of Earth, Planetary and Space Sciences over at UCLA. Uh, he's going to be talking about Parker's Solar Probe. Marco got his uh, PhD from the University of Pisa uh, a few years back and has worked at a number of different research institutions ranging from uh, JPL to Caltech to St. Andrews to Florence and is currently uh, situated at UCLA. His research focuses on space and plasma physics generally with specific specific interests in uh, stability of magnetic structures, trying to understand propagation of waves, and magnetized turbulence. He's the PI of heliospheric origins on Parker Solar Probe, and is going to be talking today about uh, one of the key science questions from Probe, understanding coronal heating and solar wind acceleration. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Marco. Can you all hear me? Okay, so um, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm really glad to be here. It's the first time I'm visiting actually the University of Arizona, so um, it's fun for me, uh, it's a privilege. Um, so today my talk is going to be about understanding the solar wind, um, but I thought I would give some small um, introduction to the solar wind. Um, uh, Eugene Parker uh, just got the Cawford Prize um, uh, um, just the other day. So a good way to uh, kind of uh, honor him in some sense by giving a little bit of history, uh, hopefully with some information that is not common knowledge, although I'm sure a few of you in the room uh, know about it. Um, then I'll discuss solar probe and a couple of physical problems that have come out um, from the first measurements of solar probe, and they relate to our understanding of uh, solar wind heating and uh, um, so coronal and solar wind heating and acceleration. So let's start from the uh, total eclipse of 2017. Um, and this is a beautiful view of the solar corona. And I've called it the laminar view because if you look at the corona in this way, it seems like an ex extremely peaceful uh, environment in equilibrium. And, uh, and indeed, um, it is extremely beautiful. Of course, it was in the 40s that it was realized that the coronium lines that were coming from the solar corona meant that the temperature of this beautiful white light, um, electron white light scattered, really, um, corona uh, was somewhere above a million degrees. Um, and by the way, uh, I mean, this is the first eclipse and only eclipse that I've seen live. And I've got to tell you, your eye sees it much more like this than like this. This is how your cell phone sees it. Uh, <laughs> um, but especially if you have a pair of binoculars and, you, and you're courageous enough to look at the sun, I mean, during, total, during totality and you've timed yourself well, you really see the corona this way, I guess, because your eye has all the processing that's required to uh, look at edges and see detail and structure. Um, among the structure that I want to just uh, mention here is what you see are these rays coming from the somewhat looks closer to the poles of the sun. Um, these, these rays are also known as uh, polar plumes, and they extend outward tens of solar radii, actually, and then they kind of disappear. Um, then we see what's called the streamers and the streamer belt. And you really can't um, help but imagining something that, like a dipole that was kind of stretched out. And so what you see is the closed field lines being pulled open by something like, for example, a solar wind. But in addition to, you, you'll notice that this kind of streamer belt, you have to be careful for projection effects, of course. But you really have the impression that this is a multipolar structure. It's not a simple dipolar structure. And also you see that while some of these openings and rays extend outward, as, you know, this is at least 1.5 to solar radii, others have little stalks that come above them much closer in. And these are a small fraction of a solar radius. You see another one here. And these uh, turn out most of the time to be what we call pseudo streamers. That is a multipolar region, which is actually surrounded by a unipolar region outside. Okay? So uh, <coughs> the magnetic field clearly um, is what's providing structure to this high temperature gas. Otherwise, there's no reason why this wouldn't be completely uniform in space. It can only be the magnetic field that does this. But it's an interesting process that it gives structure. It provides the cage, but in the end, it also provides the source of energy of the heating of this system. So the cage, um, if you think of this as an outflow, um, it holds it back, it produces a solar corona, but it also provides energy to it. Um, so let's go back. And because the history of space exploration and the solar corona and solar wind is, I think, very closely related to the history of uh, the discovery of what's outside the atmosphere of the Earth. And um, 
This is what basically, this is from an Italian outreach book from 1947, right after the war. And it really has the basics of uh, in situ exploration basically up to date. Explorer 2 and then the reconstructed V2, which was exploring the other upper atmosphere. And we see Aurora here. And then, of course, on October 4th, 1957, uh, there is the successful launch of the Sputnik. And not Pravda doesn't really notice that, um, but the success of the Soviet launch becomes apparent only after it gets uh, picked up by, of course, everyone in the US. And the New York Times, as often happens, goes on a full sort of um, what we would call fake news kind of uh, uh, <laughs> uh, information and says that you're never going to be able to use these satellites for any kind of thing military. The only reason they're interesting is that the new information concerning the nature of the sun cosmic radiation, solar radio interference, and static producing phenomena radiating from the north and south magnetic poles. And all of this information would be an estimable value for those who are working on the problem of sending missiles and eventually man into the vast reaches of the solar system. So it's basically a, I would call it a kind of a space weather uh, manifesto before, before the times. Then of course a first glimpse, I'm oh, sorry, what happened here? Okay. So then at the beginning of 1958 um, is the famous Parker paper on uh, the solar wind. And of course, it had been suggested on the basis of comet tales uh, and Biermann's work in Germany that there had to be a streaming out. T comets show two kinds of tails, a dust tail and an ion tail, and the separation of the two, the ion tails coming out. And so there's a speed, an outflow. And so Parker builds a model for this. And he suggests that uh, you know, the outstreaming gas draws out the line of force of solar magnetic fields, et cetera. Um, Soon after that, <coughs> of course, um, so at the, let, let me just give you a brief um, um, exposition of the Parker theory. So how is this, what's this based on? Well, it's based on the fact that if you take an atmosphere um, and you imagine that it's in static equilibrium, dp by dr, and they put a two there because the corona's hot, so the, if the density of the ions is n, then the density of particles is 2n, essentially if it's basically protons, and so there's the mass of the proton here for gravity. But essentially, you have dp by dr is minus mg over r squared, okay? And the pressure is 2 nkt. So if you imagine the solar corona to extend as a, as a static atmosphere outward, then the density, then the pressure or the density uh, decays exponentially um, by a function which goes like 1 over tr squared, okay? Because you have to, uh, you have to include the fact that here you have um, the pressure of the, of the plasma on the left-hand side. So p is nkt. And basically, t can be any arbitrary function of r. So when you integrate, you find that this is your pressure. So you have 1 over kt r squared. And the behavior of this integral changes depending on whether kt decays faster or slower than uh, r squared, and, and, and than r, because this integral changes character, of course, when this becomes 1 over r. So essentially, if t of r f uh, falls slower than 1 over r, finite pressure at infinity is required to confine the atmosphere. However, because we have 2 million degrees and we have a highly conducting atmosphere, the thermal conductivity, the, 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 um, the, the thermal conduction is proportional to k to t to the 5 halves. And so you expect a temperature which decays like r to the minus 2 sevenths, which is smaller than r to the minus 1. Therefore, you would need a finite pressure. And this is the conclusion of Parker, since we know of no general pressure at infinity, which can balance p of infinity here, computed from equation 9, then we have to conclude that um, no star can have a complete hydrostatic equilibrium out to large distances. And therefore, there has to be a wind. Now, of course, the Soviets kept launching satellites. Um, and in 19, the beginning of 1959, uh, Luna 1, uh, known as Mechta, missed the moon. It was supposed to crash on the moon, but it missed. So it became the first interplanetary object and had the first measurements of solar wind. But it wasn't clear whether it was a consistent phenomenon rather than an intermittent phenomenon at all. Then there were other lunas that had similar sparse measurements. Same time, more or less the same time, uh, NASA is born in part as a direct reaction to the, to the uh, launch of Sputnik. And in October of 58, the Simpson Committee says that's the first real uh, decision on the space exploration program already envisages a solar probe to pass inside the, the orbit of Mercury to study the particles and fields inside at the vicinity of the sun. So the program for going close to the corona to figure out how it's working, of course, those back very long. This is my uh, version of the Mariner 2. 
uh, Marsh and Oegebauer and, and uh, Snyder. Uh, they made the first continuous measurements of the solar wind. And in fact, if you look at this diagram from the Marin 2 data, you can uh, see that the solar wind is not a uniform speed, but has oscillations between slower wind and faster wind. Um, and this is with distance from the sun between essentially Venus um, and the Earth. Okay, so let me give you this part of the argument, which some of you know about, but um, I just very briefly, I want to tell you um, something about this. So the, 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 the argument between Parker and others who did not believe in solar wind theory went on for a little bit, but it was kind of cut short by the fact that we observe the solar wind supersonically. But still, the question remains, is the pressure argument correct? Is it true that the solar wind exists and is supersonic because the pressure of the interstellar medium is so small? And the answer to that is not as simple as you might expect. The answer to this is a partial yes, okay? So let's get to this and let's explain why. So uh, the reason I got kind of in, interested in this was because uh, I got asked why was the solar wind supersonic and I found out by looking at the literature that it wasn't as obvious as it seemed. In particular, Liam Mestel, who passed away recently as well, who's an astrophysicist, but mostly uh, stellar magne magnetism in Brighton uh, most recently, was quoted in a paper by Roberts and Soward discussing the stellar winds and breezes where the temperature at the base of the solar corona 10 to the 5 Rather than the generally accepted 10 to the 6, the total pressure far from the sun would suffice to suppress the solar wind entirely. And indeed, the pressure of the interstellar medium at 10 to the minus 12, 9 per cent, uh, square centimeter, confines a 10 to the 5 degree solar corona. So the story is not <coughs> as simple as you might imagine. In reality, you can look at all the flows for an isothermal atmosphere. It's quite simple. You basically have to put mass conservation um, in, take it into play. And then you just have to take momentum, uh, the momentum equation. And the, you can see these are extremely simple equations. If you're an isothermal atmosphere, this is a, sim a simple set of coupled equations. So you introduce the Mach number, U over CS, where CS is the sound speed, P is CS squared times rho. And you get a very simple equation, M minus 1 over M times dm by dr is 2 over R minus G over R squared. And this is a very famous equation. And it's well known by engineers because it's the Laval nozzle equation. What this shows is that a flow uh, has, um, the stationary flow has a critical point where the Mach number is one, at which point uh, either the right-hand side here, which is basically comes from the spherical expansion of your medium, two over R, minus gravity, G over R squared, either this is positive, negative, or zero. So if this is zero, then no problem. You know, uh, if this goes to zero before Mach ever reaches one, then you don't have a problem. If this goes to zero before Mach reaches one, then you have to stop your solution. There's no solution. And then there's one particular solution in which this goes to zero at the same time as this. You can integrate this equation and in terms of initial condition, and it's a very simple equation, one half m squared minus m zero squared, that's from m m prime, minus the log, and this is a simple equation to integrate two log r minus blah, blah. And it's well known that what I've just told you can be described by this um, phase diagram where you have all the possible solutions in terms of Mach as a function of radius. And so if your left-hand side m minus 1 over m goes to 0 first, then you have these solutions that are double valued on the left. Um, if you start from the sun and the right-hand side goes to zero before Mach ever reaches one, then the, the slope changes and you get what's called a breeze. You have an acceleration and then a deceleration. Then there are these other apparently unphysical solutions on the side here, this region called two. So these, uh, and then there's this region three of supersonic flow everywhere. Okay? And one specific solution, the one I've got with this orange dot, is the solution that Parker claims. So it's a solar wind, which is very low speed, at the sun, and then um, accelerates smoothly across the point where Mach equals to 1, where the right-hand side vanishes, which in my particular case I've ch taken at r equals 10, as people used to think back um, at the time. And then it smoothly accelerates outwards. So the question was, why on earth should of all, between all these possible flows, why should this one be chosen? Now, this is where uh, an interesting history of physics should appear. Because in, in the 1950s, 1951, Herman Bondi, who was not exactly a nobody, um, wrote a fundamental paper in stellar physics uh, 
on spherically symmetric accretion. Okay? And in this paper, he studied all polytropic flows going out or going in to an object. In fact, he was interested in flows going in to an object towards a star. And, and that's, that's the first place you will ever see that diagram that I've shown you. But it's upside down because we're talking about negative Mach numbers. We're talking about flows accreting onto a star. Okay? So we're seeing the exact same diagram I showed you before. These are breezes. These are the double-valued um, solutions on the left. These were the double-valued solutions that were on the right. And these are superphonic solutions. And so what uh, our friend Bondi shows is that the only solutions of interest for accretion are the ones that are down here, up here, up here, all the way up to the um, transonic accretion flow, which is the one um, that you're coming through down here. So it's interesting because this, this excuse me, it's interesting because this is exactly the same diagram that I've just shown you before. And the equations that I've just shown you are completely symmetric in the sine of m. If you look at this pressure profile, if I send m into minus m, I get exactly the same solution. Okay? So what's actually happening? What's actually happening is that if you look at the pressure for all these solutions as, they move, as you move away from the star and you take, you can solve this problem explicitly for an isothermal wind, you have p is p0 exponential of the Mach at the base, m0, minus the Mach squared, minus this number. So what happens? If you take a breeze which has a very low Mach number, let's take this, the simplest possible case, an isothermal static atmosphere which goes to infinity, then m0 is 0, okay? It ex then m is 0 everywhere. You have a finite pressure at infinity which is given by p0 e to the minus gr over c squared. So this has a finite pressure at infinity. Okay, now let's increase the Mach number. Well, if you increase the Mach number, okay, the Mach number at infinity goes to zero in all of these solutions, it, they decay. So as the Mach number goes up, the pressure increases at infinity. So the pressure for this solution at infinity is larger than the pressure for this. The pressure at infinity for this solution is larger than the pressure for this. The pressure for this solution is larger than the pressure for this. So now imagine, by, by experiment, ideal experiment, you have an atmosphere which is completely static, okay? And you increase the pressure of the interstellar medium. What would you expect to happen? If you have a static atmosphere and for some reason the interstellar medium pressure goes up. You're in a room, you open the window, the pressure outside is identical to the pressure inside. Then the pressure outside increases. What's going to happen? Wind is going to come in to your room, not out. So you have a first indication here that there's something wrong with these solutions because the way the Mach number changes with the, with the conditions outside is in the wrong direction. These solutions are not outflow solutions. These solutions are accretion solutions. They don't exist for outflows. Or rather, you can build them because the equations are symmetric, but you'll find that they're unstable. Now, on the other hand, you can also build supersonic solutions that meet a finite pressure at infinity, and then you have to put a shock in the flow. All right? That's stable. Um, it's easy to prove that any solution with a shock in the flow is stable. In fact, this kind of equation with a shock in the flow for accretion had been put in by McRae in 1956. But now we get an intriguing problem. I showed you that the pressure at infinity for these solutions here increases with the base Mach number. Okay? So what's the highest pressure at infinity that's available? It's when you go up along this critical solution, and then you have a discontinuity in the corner. That's the fastest possible breeze. You come down. You see you have smooth solutions here, you move up closer and closer to this critic point, and there you have a V, right? That, because it has the largest Mach number, in fact, it has the Mach number of the supersonic flow, is the largest possible Mach number. Therefore, if you come down along this line, you have the biggest possible pressure at infinity. Wait a minute. That means that if I build this solution, it has a pressure at infinity, which has got to be smaller. 
All right? So now, let's take this game and turn it around. Suppose I have a supersonic wind with a shock. Now the pressure at infinity goes up. What's going to happen? Well, the shock is going to be pushed inwards, right? And as the pressure goes up, it's going to be pushed further in. This dotted line actually shows where the shock is for the isothermal flow, by the way. Pushes further in, pushes further in, pushes further in. You get to this point. Now you push a little more. Where do you go? You can't go here because the pressure at infinity for these solutions is lower. Where do you go? Well, what happens is this. As long as things are like this, the sun doesn't even know what the pressure of the interstellar medium is because there's no causal connection. Sound waves are the only things that can communicate what's going on. And sound waves cannot cross this shock, right? But the minute I get here, all of a sudden the Mach flow becomes lower than one, sound waves communicate, and the sound waves from the interstellar medium are telling the sun, our pressure is way too high for you to survive this. So this has to collapse into spherically symmetric accretion. So this is a drawing of it. Um, this is the stability. And what you can show, quite simply, is that as you push this thing in, this collapses into supersonic accretion with a shock. So a star really can't have it, doesn't have much choice. It either blows a stellar wind, which is supersonic with a shock, or stuff falls on itself. There is a very small value of pressure ranges where you can have subsonic breezes accreting onto a star. But the value of pressures is so small that it's practically a set of zero dimension. Okay, so the reason the solar wind is supersonic is not so much that the pressure at infinity is small, but it's the fact that we're lucky that it's happening that way because if it were going the other way, there'd be stuff falling on our heads. There's nothing in between. And this, of course, has applications to galactic fountains and other issues um, for other super um, stellar winds. But I, I thought it would be interesting to let you know. This is not, unfortunately, this is not well known, um, but hopefully it will be. So, um, of course, when you're dealing with the isothermal solar wind, you don't care about energy. And so our discussion here today is about how the corona is powered and how the wind is powered. So let me, again, in the vein of um, theory, um, ex explain what, what you need. So this is the energy equation um, for a flow. And suppose you start at the sun and you go at 1 AU and you're following magnetic fields coming out, okay? Then basically you're saying that the divergence of the energy flux, which is made up of the mechanical energy in the wind, the enthalpy in the wind, the potential energy of the wind, viscous heating, if there's viscosity in your system, you can have heating of the wind, thermal conduction, Q, of the wind, and then S, the electromagnetic pointing flux, which crosses the photosphere to power the corona. All of that would be conserved, except that there's a part of it that leaves. That part is radiation. We see the sun in ultraviolet and in x-rays. That energy is lost. Once it becomes photons, that energy is lost from the system, so it's no longer there. Now, in a coronal hole, which is very dark, you can kind of neglect this. But for the sort of the rest of the sun, you can't. Now, believe it or not, at the sun, there's somebody who dominates all of this. Two actors dominate this at the sun. Essentially, gravity and the electromagnetic flux. Because none of the rest, the photosphere is at 6,000 degrees. The escape speed from the, front is, from the sun is 600 kilometers per second. The pressure is not uh, co contribute to this. So basically, you just have this piece and S. So if we call the contribution of S, um, essentially this one here, this piece here, um, if we give names and labels to everybody else, at 1 AU, by the time you get to 1 AU, the only thing that counts is the flow. You don't care about anything else. Gravity disappears. It's just flow. So if you put these things together and you integrate this from the sun all the way out to 1 AU, you can write an equation which tells you what the speed of the wind is in terms of how much energy S is coming up, how much energy you lose by radiation, 
divided by the mass flux, because that's a speed, and it's squared. And then you have to subtract the fact that you've got to get out of the gravitational potential well. So you've got to subtract v, g squared, which is the escape speed from the sun. So this tells you what kind of speed you expect. So in a coronal hole, you can throw this piece away. And essentially, the, escape, the speed you get depends in, explicitly on how much energy is coming through, boiling through the photosphere in terms of electromagnetism. Why is that important? It's important because of uh, uh, quite a few things. So let me go back now to the momentum equation. And I've rewritten the momentum equation as u minus v thermal squared over u du by dr. And now, because I've got a magnetic field flux tube, it can expand in any which way. So I've, in, I've called the area of the flux tube A, 1 over A dA by dr. So now I can integrate this equation. And this tells me something about how much mass is going to leave. If I integrate this equation from the sun to the critical point where the flow becomes supersonic, I find what the base speed of the solar wind is. And the base speed of the solar wind depends on the effective thermal speed of the corona, okay, times an expansion factor, how much my flux tube from the sun has expanded out to the critical point, AC over zero, times an exponential. What is important here is that the base speed of the sun tells me how much mass flux I'm going to get. Because in the subsonic region of the wind, how much density reaches further out depends on how much speed I have at the base. Okay? So in the end, the fact that I have a faster speed here, the bigger this expansion, means that in the end, I have more mass coming out and less speed asymptotically. So for this reason, very fast expanding flux tubes have a low speed very slowly expanding flux tubes have a fast speed. All right. So this is kind of basic ABC about the sun. Now let's come to see, talk about Parker. So this is the Parker satellite. You see the thermal shield. Um, I'll talk about instruments in a second. So this is uh, the Parker deployed. And I'm going to talk about basically two instrument suites. Um, not that I wouldn't want to talk about all of them, but it's just a question of time. So Parker has a thermal shield, and then you see the four electromagnetic field antenna in the front. Then there's a boom in the back, three magnetometers, uh, uh, <coughs> an inner and outer, and a search coil. There's a final a di simple dipole antenna in the back here as well. And the antenna uh, are such that and magnetic fields allow measurements that go in frequency, magnetic fields from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the 6 hertz, depending on the um, uh, which mag and which search coil it is. So what's ex the, the instrument was built to expect magnetic field um, intensities comparable to what we have at the sun. The second very important instrument suite, of course, is the particle detectors uh, uh, instrument. Here I just want to put the accent on the fact that we have a Faraday cup sitting in front of the shield. These were estimates of how much of the distribution function we would be able to see depending on distance from the sun and speed of the spacecraft. So at 9.5, which was the original perihelion that we were supposed to have, get, um, we could, you know, the aberration of the spacecraft allowed the instruments that are on the side of the spacecraft to see most of the distribution function. But when you're further away and far from the sun, you need something that measures um, in directly in front of the shield in order to, be, to, to um, um, observe the core of the distribution function. And we were very lucky that we did that. And I'll tell, you for a I'll tell you in a second. So this is the Faraday cup in an image seen peering outside the thing. In addition, of course, we have energetic particle instruments here in the back. And not visible here is a, because it's on the opposite side, well, I guess this is it probably here, um, a small coronagraph, which has basically a heliospheric image, which sees outside, uses the shield as an occulter, and sees the side. OK. So. So why, why go so close to the sun? Well, we need to get inside um, the sun to really understand the mechanisms of the heat transfer. You saw that equation that I told you, and I, I'm just imagining that we need to have an electromagnetic energy flux, but we don't know how this happens. Um, I, I showed you the laminar corona, but the corona has flares and energetic particle acceleration, and a lot of that acceleration occurs within the first 20 solar radii. 
the region where the solar wind speed becomes um, subsonic with respect to the magnetism, um, so slower than the, what's called the alpha speed, the speed of magnetic waves, um, is called the alpha region. And it's very important to go inside that because that's the region where the magnetic field is still controlling what's going on in a, in a sense. So Parker Solar Probe um, is going to go just inside that to 9.8 solar radii. So essentially we want to see how the solar wind is channeled by the magnetic field. It's the region where the waves and turbulence are strongest. Sorry. All right. So if you look at um, simple ideas of uh, how turbulence evolves with distance from the sun, uh, this is in log now in radial. So the 1 AU is 200, um, and it's kind of this range here. Uh, 20 solar radii is around here, which is close to where the alpha endpoint is. And so the maximum, any theory provides a maximum which is just inside the alpha endpoint. So measuring the turbulence here will tell you whether it's enough, essentially, to provide the coronal heating and acceleration which is required. And of course, this region is also where, um, inside this region is of course where the collisional to collisionless transition occurs. Um, and uh, measurements from the ultraviolet coronal spectrometer showed that the solar corona, at least the coronal holes, had temperature for minor ions that were much higher than for neutral hydrogen and for electrons. So this is another important point which I won't discuss much, but it's, you know, if you're interested in the kinetic physics of the solar wind, the solar corona, the fast streams that are coming from the coronal holes have electrons which are extremely cold. In this image, we have them above a million degrees. There are some measurements that now indicate that it can even never reach a million degrees. And um, this, this corona is the one that provides the fast solar winds with speeds, speeds of 750 kilometers per second or so. So there's a real problem here in, in, uh, in um, solar basic solar physics of uh, the acceleration. I would also like to say Another thing that I'm not going to be able to talk about much is that the actual speed that you measure in the solar wind is extremely well correlated with the temperature of the protons. It's a very strong correlation. While it is not very well correlated with the temperature of the electrons at all. Okay? In fact, as I just told you, the coldest regions of the corona are the ones that give the fastest wind. So if, there's, if anything, there is an anti-correlation between coronal temperature and solar wind speed. And I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Okay, so the probe objectives were, in fact, to understand basically the coronal heating and solar wind acceleration problem, and then to understand where different types of solar wind streams come from. We've seen that you have fast solar wind streams, 800 kilometers per second. We have slow wind streams down to 300 and lower kilometers per second. What are the different source regions? And finally, determine the mechanisms that accelerate and transport energetic particles. So this is an orbit diagram, and uh, this is actually for the original launch date. The launch slipped to August 12th, and that meant a few days change in, the, um, in these flyby dates and the first. So the first perihelion was actually November 5th uh, uh, of uh, uh, 2018. We've had our, our, uh, our, our Venus flyby number three was delayed just a little bit, and our peri we just went through the fourth perihelion, which is the first perihelion at 27 um, solar radii. So we've had three perihelion at 35.7 solar radii and one perihelion just now, but we don't have any data from it yet uh, at uh, 26, um, between 26 and 27 solar radii. We are going to go through a further six, um, five Venus approaches before we get into the solar corona at 10 solar radii. Um, this is now a view of the dynamic corona. So this is from the Ulysses spacecraft, its first three orbits, and, and uh, basically uh, Ulysses saw the corona at, at a first minimum and at a very weak minimum, which was the previous solar minimum to the present one. And what you'll notice here is that this is a polar diagram of solar wind speeds versus latitude. So this Ulysses went outside of the ecliptic plane. And what you'll notice um, here is that the speeds are comparable, in fact. So the solar wind speed doesn't change dramatically between uh, this very weak minimum and the previous minimum. What did change was the uh, mass flux and energy flux. At solar maximum, there is no clear uh, definition of high and low speed streams, uh, but it really depends on the topology of the solar corona uh, 
that you're uh, traversing. So I've made a poor man's prediction for the com upcoming years. So basically, we just have to tack on. So this, was, this, is, this would be um, our launch date, 2018. So 2019, we're down here, and we're seeing the first sunspots of the next solar cycle. And probe should last into 2026, so the next solar maximum as well. Okay, so coming back to the theory of solar wind, you're probably already tired of this, um, uh, but the real solar wind model stationary state would have to solve for um, um, conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. We need, a, we need a flux of energy to provide a heat for the corona, and that comes in terms of a, uh, a magnetic and kinetic, possibly, um, contribution from the pointing flux. So these are electromagnetic, electromagnetic, hydrodynamic, lower frequency waves, typically alpha waves, or slow coronal motions in the corona. There may be a contribution from density fluctuations because of the very jetty nature of the corona that we see at the sun. So, turbulence. We observe it in the solar wind, and for the reasons that I just told you, we need a source of waves um, into the corona to provide its heating. Now, understanding this is a problem, is a huge problem on its own. Hydrodynamic turbulence is a very difficult problem. Magnetohydrodynamic turbulence is an even harder problem. But I, I don't, you know, I'll, I'll stop with equations really soon now. So this is the last, really the last big equation you'll see um, in today's talk. But this describes the propagation of waves along magnetic fields. And what's really important is that there is a, a typical wave, which is the Alphen wave, which has, which, in which the magnetic field and the velocity field um, are, behave as though uh, are correlated, essentially. So the magnetic field behaves like a violin cord, and you stretch it. That perturbs the magnetic field. You have a correlated velocity field with that. And depending on the sign of the correlation, the wave propagates along the field or against the field. And these are called Z plus or Z minus. So just to confuse you, when Z minus is equal to zero, so delta U is equal to delta B, the wave propagates along the minus direction. When the uh, velocity field and the magnetic field are anti-correlated, delta U is equal to minus delta B, so Z plus is zero, then you propagate along the field. Said otherwise, Z minus goes along plus B, and Z plus goes along minus B. Okay, just to confuse you. Now, it's what's stated, kind of stated here. Okay, and <clears throat> what you'll notice, though, is that the propagation depends on how fast the wind is going, because it's the wind that vex things. So there's a Doppler shift because of the solar wind. So that means that the waves, once U is bigger than VA, are all advected outwards. However, underneath one type of wave can't, propagates backwards. So you can't really understand the state of the turbulence in the corona below the alpha point by looking outside because you're missing a crucial component. And the, the crux of all of this is that the nonlinear interactions, the turbulence, that, the nonlinearity that drives the dynamics of magnetic fields in a plasma is an interaction between minus and plus. So you need waves going in both directions to get any kind of nonlinear interactions, okay? Then, of course, the solar wind, you know, hydrodynamic turbulence is complicated on its own. For the solar wind, we have the fact that the wind is non-homogeneous, so there's speeds that are different in different places. There's the overall spherical expansion, so waves are actually pushing the wind, as I told you before. They're actually contributing to accelerate the wind, and therefore they damp because of that. So <coughs> nonlinearity and expansion are crucial, and it's a multi-scale problem, and you've got to solve scales that go from about 1 AU down to at least 10 to the minus 5 AU, but in fact you have to go down to a few meters or centimeters if you want to get down to where the turbulence actually dissipates in the solar wind. So that's an extremely complex problem. In the solar wind, you observe turbulence, and you observe um, typically that fast wind has uh, stronger turbulence amplitudes and the spectra looks something like a big piece which is flatter than what you would expect on the basis of sort of standard turbulence theory and a piece which looks evolved after the minus five thirds. And as you move away from the sun, these were measurements with Helios before Parker probe. I will show you Parker solar probe in a second. The, see, the overall energy falls dramatically. 
And that fall is mostly due to the work that the waves do on the expanding solar wind. But in addition, the spectrum steepens as you move out. And the, the knee, which separates low to high frequency, propagates inward towards the sun. That's the fast wind. The slow wind is mostly just completely evolved turbulence all the time. So there's a big difference between fast and slow wind. Now, in addition, there's a remarkable property of the turbulence in the fast wind. Um, let me come back to the coronal problem, and this is just to illustrate that now I've straightened things out, so I've made plus go outwards to not, not confuse you. Uh, but what I'm showing you here is what happens if you take a corona and propagate waves outward, and you look at the inward propagating wave that results from the expansion and reflection that you have because of the gradients, and you can see here what I was trying to say. Below the, out, this is distance and this is time. Below the alpha point, inward waves propagate backwards by and large, and then and this kind of region acts as kind of a source of diverging characteristics. So if you want to see what the non-interactions here are, you cannot measure here because you're missing a, compo a crucial component. And I'm going to skip this because it's too complicated. So let's look now at the properties of the alpha and waves and turbulence. So those spectra that I show you show very large fluctuations in the magnetic field, but very small fluctuations in the magnetic field magnitude. So this is a, a profile in hours. These are the three components of the magnetic fields. This is, uh, could be any distance between 0.3 and 1 AU. If you look at the magnitude of the magnetic field, it's basically constant. But the three components are oscillating. So if you look at a hodogram, you see that the vector is oscillating on a sphere. This is, shows it even better. And this is now six hours, this is one hour, and this is 10 minutes. And what you see is that basically this kind of feature survives to fairly low frequency. So we have waves, we have turbulence because there's a spectrum, but the turbulence is strange because the magnetic field vector oscillates on the tip of a sphere. Okay? So the magnitude of the magnetic field is constant. That's a very strange state of affairs. But it's telling you something. You see, if, if the magnitude of the magnetic field changed a lot, that would generate compressions. It would create density fluctuations. The absence of changes in the magnitude of B means that you have small density fluctuations. Okay? But it also means that you have a highly correlated, there's a hidden correlation in your system. Because if B squared is constant, the components of the field can't wiggle around any which way they want. All right? Um, this is another, again, showing um, that uh, the magnetic field is constant. And there's another consequence of that. Let's look at this turbulence uh, better. This is um, Helios, I think, is from 76. And this is showing the speed of the solar wind uh, during a few days. And what you look at, if you look at the speed of the solar wind in the Helios data, you see that the wind speed here is a fast stream, clearly 700 kilometers per second. But you see how spiky it is? It has all these little radial jets in it. And this is going to be, come back to kind of haunt us in a, in a few minutes. Um, the important thing about this um, talk is explaining what these, why B squared is constant. So what does this mean from the physical point of view that B squared is constant? What it really is telling you is that if you go in the frame of reference of the waves, okay, the electric field vanishes. So basically, when you come back to the frame of the solar wind, these are pure alpha waves, so in the frame of the waves, V and B are the same, and V, the velocity, also oscillates on the tip of a sphere. There's no electric field. But when you come back into the solar wind frame of reference, because the magnetic field is an invariant, a Galilean invariant for, for low speeds, magnetic field stays constant, but the wind now oscillates. Okay? So that's point one. And the other point, which I will now show you, is associated with the, mag with the property of the magnitude of B um, being um, conserved. 
is these radial fluctuations in the solar wind speed. So I'll come back to these in a second. Remember that you have all these spiky jets here in the solar wind. So let's look at some properties of, <coughs> of waves where the magnetic field magnitude is constant. So this is the question. What is the largest possible oscillation of the magnetic field in a situation where your turbulence is confined onto a sphere of constant magnitude? Okay? So imagine you have a field and you know that the magnetic field is going to be oscillating on a sphere. Then what's the biggest delta B you can do? You can't do an oscillation as big as you want. You're forced to have an oscillation which is at most bigger, as big as the diameter of the sphere, right? Which is two times the value of the field, B. You can't do anything bigger than that, all right? And indeed, if you do a statistics of the measurements in the solar wind, what happens? Most of the measurements sit inside delta B over B less than two, because those are the only ones that can have B constant. You have a little bit of magnitude pressure. Magne B wasn't exactly constant, and you do have some excursions beyond that. But the magnitude of that excursion depends on the time frame. Okay? Depends on how, how much time you let pass between one oscillation and the other. So, <clears throat> if you look at a histogram of delta B over B as a function of the, of the, time, of the number of uh, instances in which you observe it, and let's change the lags from one second to two seconds to five seconds to 10 seconds to 20 seconds. The distribution, as you move away, so for very short times, of course, the magnitude and the, the delta of mod B over B is very small because you, the tip of the vector only oscillates very small. But as you increase the time lag, then you can increase the magnitude, and you would tend towards a distribution which looks pretty square and uniform between zero and two with a small tail of compressive effects, okay? Now, <coughs> what happens? What happens is that if you now imagine that you have a spectrum, a turbulent spectrum in your oscillations, okay? The spectrum depends on the intrinsic magnitude, some level, but it also depends on the slope, okay? If a slope is very steep and you give it enough energy, the fluctuation amplitude grows above any limit, okay? So what you can show quite simply is that the maximum, um, the steepest spectrum, which is compatible with preserving the condition that the magnitude of B is constant, is the spectrum 1 over f. You cannot have anything steeper than 1 over f and preserve the condition that the magnitude of b be constant at the larger scales, at the largest lags, okay? So that provides at least a kinematic explanation for the presence of an f to the minus 1 region of the spectrum. So the two things that appear to be independent are in fact connected. Mod B constant means that you have to have, at high energies, when you're close to the sun, an f to the minus 1 domain. When you get far away from the sun, it doesn't matter because the energy has become so low that the amplitude of the fluctuations compared to the mean becomes so small that can the spectrum be, can be anything it wants. But if you turn the argument around and you imagine that you have a full-blown turbulence in the lower corona that is heating the solar corona, and then you propagate it upward, then because of the d collapse of the density, the amplitude of the fluctuation grows, grows, grows. At some point, if you have a Kolmogorov spectrum, you will hit the fact that delta B becomes bigger than B. And that means that you have to have compressions. So as you move from the lower corona into the solar wind, at some point, you can't avoid creating density fluctuations. So there has to be a strongly compressive region of the solar corona if you start out with a spectrum of waves which is sufficient to do the job of accelerating the solar wind. So 
why does f to the minus 1 form? It would appear in this hypothesis that f to the minus 1 forms because as you move out, you generate compressions that dissipate that part of the spectrum and therefore leave you with the smallest, with the steepest uh, possible spectrum compatible with B constant, which is f to the minus 1. So in this view of the world, f to the minus 1 is born as kind of a filtering process of the solar corona. So I still haven't said what does that have to do with jets. Okay. So Jack Gosling many years ago, um, I think he was the first that kind of <coughs> brought this in some form to its complete exposition, noticed that if you look at the solar wind, and this is, for example, Ulysses at two astronomical units, you see the micro there's a microstream structure uh, discovered by Marsha, which lasts about a day. This is one day, so you see a peak and then a minimum. But on top of that, you see jets going upwards. If you look at the wind data at 1 AU, you see something similar. If you look at Helios at 0.3 AU, you see this even more. So you see that solar wind has as though it's a base and then a one-sided um, series of jets coming off of that. And how is this connected to the alpha waves? Well, it is. These, what you're seeing in these radial jets are these large amplitude alpha waves. And I will explain in a few minutes how that works. But let's come to measurements from probe. So the reason I'm skipping here, so this is Helios at point three astronomical units, and this is the velocity field, okay? So you see this strongly jetty structure over a day. So probe, okay, so probe, this was supposed to move. So probe's moving around the sun. It's better to look at this from the point of view of the sun rotating, and this is the Earth, because this tells you compared to the sun how probe is moving. And what you'll see is that as probe moves in, it becomes retrograde for a while, okay? The reason is that when probe is very far away, it's rotating much slower than the sun, but when it's at perihelion, it's actually rotating around the sun faster than the sun. So there's a retrograde period here. That means that during its first perihelion, in fact, its first free perihelion, it sits on the similar region on the sun for a long time. This is just a preliminary um, thing. And these were the first magnetic field measurements that were made. This was the first, I think this was the first um, data set that came down uh, from probe. And this is, this is directly in what's called New York seconds here, fortunately. But anyway, so this is a measurement of the radial magnetic field as a function of time. And this is away from perihelion, coming into perihelion and away from perihelion. And so what you see is that the magnetic field, this is nanotesla, comes down to about minus 80, 90 nanotesla, and then comes back up. But if you look on top of that, you have these very sharp oscillations of the radial magnetic field. So the magnetic field you're looking at, probe is crossing and it sees magnetic field going one way, the other way, one way, the other way, one way, in this very bursty fashion. And this is a detail of that, and I'll, you'll see it in, in many more pictures. So this is BR again. This is now with the proper dates put underneath. And you see this is the radial magnetic field as a function of time. And the resolution of this is seconds, okay? So you can kind of see the modulation of the magnetic field on top of this. So what's going on? So what's going on is that you're crossing and the magnetic field's going back and forth. Is that possible? Is that magnetic field from the sun so complicated it's coming back and forth? Well, the answer to that question is um, no. Most of these crossings that you see are related to the picture I just showed you before. Oh, gosh. Sorry, this is a bit slow. So let's look at the velocity field. So this is from the fundamental Faraday cup, which other, so this is the radial velocity field seen by probe around perihelion. Again, you see that the velocity field is made up of jets. And these jets actually correlate with the magnetic field oscillations that you've seen. Yeah, I'll come to the end of this very quickly. So I, I will conclude with this alpha wave issue. All right, so what's going on? <coughs> 
What's going on is that we have these humongous Alphan waves that are coming away from the sun. Okay? Remember, a wave that's propagating away from the sun has an anti-correlation between magnetic field and velocity field. If a velocity field presents a positive radial jet and the magnetic field is going inward, negative, then its fluctuation will have to be going outward, right? Because delta V and delta B are the same if the magnetic field is inward, right? If the magnetic field is outward, then the correlation between V and B is negative. Delta B and delta V are negative, okay? Okay, so let's look back at this plot one more time. So here we see an average negative B, a large positive fluctuation of B on top of that negative. The correlation between B is, B is positive, so you see a jet in velocity. So large amplitude spherical alpha waves carry with them the fact that the wind has radial jets. The two things go together, right? If you have an alpha wave going out, B and V are correlated opposite to the sign of the magnetic field. If the magnetic field is going in, B and V are positively correlated. So a big change, reversal in B from negative to positive means a big positive V. If it were the other way around, like it happens here, where B is positive and you see a large negative oscillation, well now, if B is positive, the correlation between V and B that goes outward is negative. So here we have a negative delta B. That means that you have a positive delta V again. So all alpha waves that invert the magnetic field, all waves that kink the magnetic field like this, produce radial velocity jets. Okay. So very large amplitude waves that kink the magnetic field produce radial jets. And that's what we're seeing at probe. We're seeing this at probe. The problem with what we're seeing at probe is that we're seeing huge alpha waves which produce radial jets. But if you look at the average speed of the wind at perihelion, 5th of November, it's 300 kilometers per second. So we are seeing in the very fast, in the very slow solar wind, very large outwardly propagating alpha waves. This is contradictory to everything I've shown you before. Okay? So to make a, a, a short summary statement, all these waves that are supposed to exist in the fast solar wind at probe are seen in the slow solar wind. So that introduces a very important question as to the role that the alpha waves play in acceleration of the solar wind. So why is it that we see big alpha waves here? At 1 AU, we don't. In the slow wind, we don't see alpha waves. They disappear. Now, there's a whole part of this that I will not be able to go through. And it has to do with the fact that at perihelion, the um, probe was sitting on a very, very small coronal hole on the sun. And this very small coronal hole had a huge expansion factor of the magnetic field. So, because I'm finished and I won't have time to say much else, let me just show you a picture of what kind of expansion the coronal field must have to produce this kind of wind. So, this is not exactly the same place, but it gives you an idea. So, what we've learned now <coughs> with probe is that you can have very small sources on the sun which have a huge expansion factor and therefore, a probe is sitting somewhere here, and it's always projecting back into a small coronal hole. And the wind from coronal holes that have this huge expansion can be very slow and yet be permeated, at least close to the sun, by huge alpha waves. So what do I conclude from that? I think the solar wind is born full of these waves all the time. So the sun generates at its base humongous alpha waves everywhere. We only see them, though, at large distances where they can survive. At, at probe, where we're getting close enough to the sun, we start seeing them in places where we don't usually see them at 1 AU because they decay. They get destroyed by all the inhomogeneities that exist in the solar wind. There was a whole part three of this talk, which is not going to happen. So 
Let me just stop um, and tell you that we have another probe that is going to be launched quite soon, Solar Orbiter. And um, with the launch of Solar Orbiter, I think we will be able to reconstruct the history of the plasma as it moves from the sun to 1AU uh, in a way which has never been done before. So this is probe here, the orbit of probe. Uh, next week on Sunday, we're going to launch. This is Stereo A. Um, this is green as Earth. And soon you'll see appearing here once we get to February 2020. Here it is, Solar Orbiter. It's also going to Venus. And as you can kind of see, the combination of these orbits allows for alignments and quadratures between the spacecraft at different distances from the sun so that we'll be able to follow the evolution of a plasma parcel um, between tens of solar radii and out into the heliosphere itself. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. If there are any, well, I will get the microphone working. There we go. Where is the probe Which one? That one? Oh, Solar Orbiter? Cape. They're both launched from the Cape. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, um, Orbiter, they both have a very similar, at least at the beginning, their launch is very similar. They both have to catch up with Venus. Um, and use Venus gravity assist. So the difference between orbiter and probe is that probe uses Venus gravity assist essentially only to slow it down. It basically stays almost in the ecliptic, a few degrees, but not, not much. And it gets close to the sun to 37. Orbiter, on the other hand, uses Venus for two things. One is to slow it down, and the other is to change its inclination. So it, after the first few orbits, the ones that you see later are actually projected onto the ecliptic plane. The perihelion of, uh, of orbiter never goes below point, um, point two six two seven AU. So it's a little bit inside the orbit of Mercury, but it never gets much closer. No, the orbiter has a, a full complement of um, remote sensing telescopes as well. It has uh, an ultraviolet imager with, um, with four channels. It has a coronagraph, a white light coronagraph. It has a uh, Doppler magnetograph, so it measures the magnetic field on the sun and the, velo the velocity field on the surface of the sun at the photosphere. It has an X-ray um, uh, telescope. And then it has, uh, as far as remote sensing, it has a heliospheric imager. It also uses an occult, uh, the occultation from the sh thermal shield to view the whole heliosphere. That's actually made by the same people of the telescope. I couldn't show you any images. Let me cheat and show you a movie made by the uh, coronagraph on, um, on solar probe. And so they're making a heliospheric imager as well. Um, this is looped in and out. Um, and I think that's it. I think that's, that's the remote sensing. In C2, it has, of course, an energetic particle suite. It has a plasma suite, has a magnetometer, two magnetometers, flux gate magnetometers, has a search coil. So it does a full complement of um, plasma and magnetic field measurements in C2 as well. Other questions? Thanks. Um, my question relates to the strength of the magnetic field you measured on the plot where you sh were showing the, yeah. the, was one of the later ones, you know, with huh? the oscillations. Uh, I was a little surprised that it's, you know, less than 100 nanotesla. Is that that's at 36 solar radii. Okay, 36. That was, that was going to be that yeah, part of right. my question. Right, so 36 solar radii. So it's actually too big. So oh, okay. in a whole part of the talk that I, that I skipped, which I'm not going to give you, don't worry, don't be afraid. Uh, but uh, so, so the problem, so if you, if you, so these green and red lines, I didn't say what they were. These were the first estimations of the magnetic field measurements that were supposed to be made may, based on photospheric magnetograms. So a solar wind MHD model based on solar magnetograms, and they were expecting it to be minus 50. So the magnetic field, the baseline of the magnetic field, minus 90 nanotesla, was found to be too large. So that meant uh, one of two things, basically. Um, one possibility which can be explored is that the magnetic field opens up closer to the sun than expected. Right? Because the magnetic field, 
if you imagine it simply as a potential field and it's like a multiple, then before the wind starts off, it decays with distance as one over r cubed or one over r to the fifth. Once the solar wind take off, takes off, it, on average, it goes down like one over r squared. So by increasing the range over which it's decaying slower, one over r squared, you can fit the magnetic field intensity better. So one possibility was that indeed, the field opens up fairly close to the sun. So in fact, so if you do potential field extrapolations, you have to put what's called the source surface fairly close to the sun in this, in this, in this case. Um, uh, and in fact, we, as, a game, as a kind of a challenge, as a game, we actually produced a, an image of where the source surface had to be to fit the magnetic field at the first perihelion. And so you see this is 2 point, this is 1, 1, 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, 1.8. 1 so you see between 2.2 and down to 1.3 solar radii, which is way too close for what is usually thought to be a place where magnetic fields are being opened up. Um, on the other hand, uh, just to complete the explanation, you can take another, you can, take a, you can think of this differently. And you can think of this, so this is this, what you see in red and black now are, a solar wind MHD model in which on the base model, which would be the red, you include the fact that these large amplitude Alphan waves also oscillate the radial field. So the fact that the Alphan waves, the magnetic field intensity in the Alphan waves decays differently from the intensity of the average field because they're oscillating and they're, the energy is being continuously exchanged between velocity and magnetic field. That changes the properties of the decay with the distance. Then if you include the waves, in fact, there's no anomaly. You can fit this pretty well, as you can see from these dark dashed lines. So I would prepend for this second <laughs> interpretation. So the wind, the magnetic field is really standard, but it's made up of this large amplitude radial oscillations that, um, that allow for this intensity to be explained. Okay, thank you. We have time for one final question. Marcia? Um, your model, you say that the switchbacks, in your model, the switchbacks are due to alpha waves. Yeah. So you would expect the helium abundance to remain constant with time as you go through a switchback. Yes, that's correct. I don't think that happens in the fast solar wind. That Parker Solar Probe does not measure helium abundance yet. Not yet, right. That's right. But in the fast solar wind switchbacks, I can show you helium variations. Right. So, the abundance so, variations. So, so, so before we, yeah. Um, can I translate your comment in a slightly different language? Sure. Right. So what I would say the fact that they are all venic is an observation. The fact that they correlate, that V and B correlates well. Now, you're asking for an interpretation in terms of a source. So you're, you're basically asking me, if these were born as simple alpha waves propagating on a uniform background, I should see no composition difference. The fact that that's not the case means that there's something special about how they're generated, i.e., they can't be a uniform wave, wave-like blob coming out of the sun. They have to have some dynamical phenomenon that allows for changes in composition. For example, reconnection between closed and open magnetic field lines. Is that, is that a good translation of your comment? That's where I was headed. That's what I thought. And so, so let me use these, this minute that, you, that I'm just taking away from you guys to say that at least in hypothesis, there, there can be at least three different ways, I mean, at least in my imagination, there can be at least three different ways to produce these big radial oscillations. One, of course, I'm sorry for the red, this doesn't work, but let's try with blue a little better. Or actually, let's, let's show you another picture from here so that maybe that'll be easier. Um, let me show a picture of, of, so to produce a structure like this is what a switchback looks like. So it's a magnetic field line the magnetic field line that comes down and then goes back up, essentially. So to, do, to produce something like that, I could reconnect. So if I have a closed loop and then an open field line next to it, and there's an X point there, and I reconnect the field lines, I produce a big S, and it propagates outwards. That's one possibility. Another possibility 
is you have different, you have field lines that are meandering and they cross different types of wind. So you have small jets. Suppose I have a small jet crossing off and you have a field line that crosses the jet. Then you have a stream shear and a shear, if you have a higher speed here and a lower speed here and it's dragging the magnetic field, if the speeds are different, it can pull a field line back and accelerate a field line forward. That also can produce a kink in the field. And I would argue that if the jets happen independently of the waves, the jets can carry the composition difference and therefore it would be hard to distinguish between a reconnection scenario direct and a shear generated scenario on the basis of composition. It does, however, rule out the third possibility that I was going to mention, which is, okay, I have these waves and they're propagating out in the spherical solar wind. Well, then guess what? Because alpha waves are waves, the way in which their intensity changes with distance from the sun is different. In particular, the radial magnetic field in an alpha wave only decays like one over r to the three halves. The average radial magnetic field decays like one over r squared. If I do the ratio, that grows like the square root of r. So all I have to do is have a little kink in the field line that doesn't big enough to invert the radial field close to the sun and I move out, it can actually kink the field line completely. But this scenario wouldn't explain composition differences. I didn't think it was the right scenario to start with, but I think that Marsha has a good point on that as well. Well, let's, let's thank the speaker again and thank you for staying up for a few minutes.